application side of applicative. Um, over the past couple of years, uh, I've seen at least a, a kind of the notion of reactive programming going from something that's been of interest to a very small number of people to something that's become uh, very widespread. Um, we had a couple of speakers yesterday touch on it tangentially, but uh, now with Matt, we're going to kind of dive into the into the details. Matt's written a huge amount, has a really extensive set of blog postings about Rx, so I'm sure he's going to do an excellent job of uh, guiding us through it. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. So today, uh, if I can get warm enough, uh, so hello and welcome everyone. Uh, this is going to be a magical journey of understanding reactive programming. As Terry said, you know, it seems to be some sort of hype around this particular word, whether it's the React framework, whether it's reactive, you name it. So what are we going what we're going to do here is we're going to take a look at one of the original uh, reactive uh, frameworks uh, that that was out there and, and I say original meaning uh, s circa 2010 and we're going to deep dive through uh, everything that uh, that is uh, Rx so uh, I just want to you know to make everyone nice functional and reactive programmers not functional reactive but functional and reactive uh, programmers let's not get the two confused here so uh, if you want to follow along, I, I've got all the slides and all of the resources uh, there as well, and that's how you can unoriginally find me just about everywhere is uh, is there on on the thing. So I always like to to give an alternate title for my talk. So in this case, uh, it's uh, how I stopped to learn uh, worry about uh, asynchronous programming and love to learn the observable. And given the the heightened tensions uh, nowadays, uh, it's it kind of uh, kind of a fun play uh, on words. But uh, the other one is is uh, old time concurrency jokes, which never to me never get old. You know, I thought I had a problem, so I thought to myself, I'll solve it with promises and events. Have now problems to I. So anyways, uh, what this is not going to be is a standard Monad tutorial. There will be no, uh, there will be Monads harmed, and I will not put the cat in category theory either. Uh, there will be slight, some slight mention of it uh, here and there, but it's not certainly uh, the, the central part of, of my talk here. Uh, so who am I? Uh, I am a uh, principal uh, SDE at uh, uh, at a uh, small company that I'll get to later, uh, and a self-described open sorcerer. Yes, so that uh, that is a hat I do have at home. Um, and like I said, I'm unoriginal where I can be found on the internet. I don't have any secret uh, fancy names. But I do work for this company here, and what I like to say is that I put a little bit of the metal back into Microsoft because, well, when you add umlauts to anything, it just gets that much more awesome. So I work on this uh, this particular product uh, called the Reactive Extensions, and um, and it's kind of a language neutral approach to uh, how we do event driven and asynchronous uh, programming. Uh, and yes, I am an RX pusher of sorts. Uh, I've been working on the team pretty much since 2010, and I focus on the .NET versions, the uh, Ruby, Python, and so forth, as well as working with a lot of teams across the board, uh, whether it's Java, uh, Objective-C, and, and Swift, and so forth. Uh, so you can find us here, uh, ReactiveX on our Twitter and ReactiveX.io, which has a lot of really cool uh, documentation for all language implementations, uh, including some work by uh, by one of our audience members here uh, to create some great uh, marble diagrams uh, to, uh, to kind of help you discover what exactly uh, Rx does. So let's go back in time just a little bit to see where we actually came from. So we were this team called the Cloud Programmability Team, and it was founded in this kind of oasis, which was uh, under Ray Ozzy. We were like, we can do whatever we want to. This is a kind of a cool place to, to innovate. So we uh, were founded by Eric Meyer and Brian Beckman. Uh, and we were a co and our particular uh, team was was codenamed Tesla because while well, we we liked Nikolai Tesla and all the zany things that he tended to do, uh, you know, without limits. 
So we found it there, and we were trying to really find out what, what was this cloud thing, and what were we trying to solve here. So we came up with so many different side projects, it was just unreal. We came up with ideas of co uh, converting uh, 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 Microsoft IL to j uh, directly to JavaScript. Uh, we had CrocScript, uh, which was lovingly named after Douglas Crockford, uh, which was uh, way before TypeScript and, a lot, and CoffeeScript, which was to write our own dialect of JavaScript with classes, modules, and even language integrated query. Uh, we had our own uh, build system that was uh, built directly for the cloud so we could build anything really distributed really fast. And then lastly, kind of our accidental discovery, which was linked to events. And I'll tell you why. So we had a project called Volta. And Volta, the idea behind that was tier splitting. So for example, I want to write a single application, and since most people at Microsoft were, were .NET programmers, I wanted to write a single program, and I wanted to, to target on any number of platforms, whether it's uh, the desktop, whether it's, oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, hold on. Okay, there we are. <clears throat> and there we go. Eh, there we go. Okay. So, um, anyways, it was uh, it, so we could take anything and compile it uh, to any particular platform. In in so much so that we could take uh, Windows Forms and compile it down to uh, to JavaScript uh, to JavaScript and HTML forms. But we had some big, big problems back then because there was no, really no such thing as, as promises uh, back in those days, or at least nothing that people used very widely. And uh, ultimately, there was you know, no such thing as task either in, in .NETs. But ultimately, we were faced with this challenge that the web, by default, is asynchronous. So what do we do? Well, what we did was we just basically said, all right, you can just annotate which part of, of your thing that you want to run on each individual part, and then we compile it down to Ajax. But the problem is we had no first class events. We couldn't get them across tiers. So what we did, tried to make them first class. So we can say methods can be transported, but the problem was the properties and indexers and, uh, and other metadata couldn't. So what we're going to be talking about here today is really about stream processing and how we got uh, and how you can take advantage of it. So in the in uh, the world we live in today, it's very much a real time uh, kind of uh, kind of world. Whether it's your phone, uh, whether it's your tablet, any number of those things, they're emitting so many uh, pieces of information at any given time. How do you keep up with it? How do you make sense of it? Because each of those particular interfaces have their own kind of way of speaking about uh, the wor uh, speaking to the world. Uh, so it could easily be where you just ultimately give up and just say, uh, you know, just start shoving it down your shirt. But ultimately, you have to deal with the fact that uh, you you have a lot of different inputs and a lot of different outputs. How do you manage it all? And I can guarantee you, most modern apps that you deal with, either on, on mobile or on web, have so many inputs and outputs that you're dealing with. So let's face it, asynchronous programming as it stands today is awful. And just to kind of give you a, a, a hint of how awful, it's basically like this, where the kid's trying to catch it after it's been... Uh, 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 after it's been fired, so uh, yeah, that's that's always a, a problem with uh, with uh, asynchronous uh, programming is n quite missing the point. So you know we had some fairly progressive presidents here in the U.S. and uh, you know back in 1962 he said you know we choose to solve asynchronous programming and do other things not because they are easy but because they are hard. This is I think a first draft and he changed it to going to the moon, but citation needed. Um, anyways. Uh, so callback hell is a really is a very real thing, and it's uh, it's where the the logic uh, since of course JavaScript is is uh, you know single threaded and you can't block for any particular I/O reason it becomes very hard to reason about your apps because when you're uh, going to then going to uh, 
start, you know, initialize a movie, then trying to uh, to uh, initialize your player, then get uh, your credentials, and then uh, call uh, authorization to get your ticket. All of those sorts of things kind of just uh, just start nesting and walking off of the screen. And what you end up with is is something like a cow's head in terms of the overall uh, look and feel of of the code. And there are so many w easy ways to get burned b by this because your the logic is so inverse that it, that the the logic kind of becomes so so hidden in what you're trying to do that you actually lose what you're trying to do. So there kind of has to be a better way of thinking about that. And even here, when you're dealing with something like uh, uh, drag and drop, well, simple drag and drop is actually fairly difficult in the fact that you have to have three different uh, event handlers, uh, one for mouse down, one for mouse move, and one for mouse up. And then you have to keep track of the state. Uh, and um, not only do you have to add the event listeners, but you also have to remove the event listeners. And what's, what's even worse is if you start to add in additional functionality, where does it go? Uh, if you need to add some sort of debounce logic to make it you know, slower, more responsive, any number of those kinds of things, you're now adding callbacks or you're adding more events. How do you, how do you synchronize them all? And it just kind of makes you want to run away like Will Smith. Uh, so it, it really is just, it's very, very clumsy. Uh, <laughs> the way that, uh, that people do it, um, and very error-prone. So let's, uh, let's step back in time a little bit, uh, back to 1994. I'm sure uh, some of you were alive back then. Uh, I know I was. Uh, so there was this book that came out. Uh, it was called The Gang of Four, um, and it ha featured one of the uh, future, uh, also fellow Microsoft employees, Eric Gamma, uh, in that book, and it was kind of a hallmark of how people started to codify and talk about design patterns uh, in code, so we could really start talking about reusable software. Uh, before then, people, you know, published a lot of academic papers and so forth, but there was really no, you know, ultimate holy grail, as it were, of of getting all of these patterns into a single book. And even though it was written in, in small talk and uh, C++, uh, still to this day, it has a lot of applicability into what we do. Uh, so let's let's actually take a look here because uh, one of the patterns that was uh, in there was uh, was the iterator pattern. And the idea behind the iterator pattern was that you could start to traverse a container and start to pull. Uh, out uh, items from it. So starting in ES6, uh, ES 2015, whatever you want to call it, it's in most in a lot of browsers now. But the idea is that we have this uh, this way of be being able to uh, to start iterating. So we say console.log. Once we get our numbers, iterator.next, and it'll give us a value of one and done false. Next, value two, done false value three, done false, and then finally done is true and value is undefined. Perfect. Uh, so that's, that's great. We have, an, we have a full-fledged interfa uh, interface for the iterator pattern. Now let's talk about the subject observer pattern. So the subject observer pattern was a fairly another interesting one uh, where you had this subject, as it were, which, uh, which had a list of notifiers. And then whenever some sort of stimulus happened, uh, whether it's uh, uh, whether it's an event or any number of things happened, it would start to fire for you. Uh, so that that pattern has been used time and time and time again with things like even uh, in the, uh, uh, the the HTML DOM uh, with add event listener and so forth. So you could say uh, doc, uh, document add event listener mouse move and then start to to log the uh, uh, that. But what you'll notice is when you just basically start moving uh, the mouse, uh, the uh, the events start triggering automatically for you. So it's kind of a, more of a push model instead of the pool model, which was the interactive uh, side of things. 
Uh, so one of our goals was, well, we know one pattern fairly well with the enumerator, uh, the iterable pattern, but we really wanted a very compositional approach uh, with what we came up with. And so we took that subject observer and said, well, could we do anything better? And I'm going to use TypeScript right here just to get people an idea of what we were, were doing. Uh, and we had a single uh, interface called Observable. And the Observable has a single method called Subscribe. So instead of having an add and remove, we have a subscribe. And that subscribe hands you back this disposable object. And now what you hand into the subscribe is uh, is this observer which uh, which will yield you a value uh, zero to infinite times whether uh, you get an on next value uh, optionally followed by an on error or on completed. So what's really kind of cool about this is now the add and remove logic has actually been removed into subscribe. So when you subscribe, it, it calls add. And then when you dispose of the disposable, it calls remove. And what you end up with is, is something that uh, is able to automatically clean up all of your resources. So for example, going back to uh, the example I had with, um, uh, with the um, uh, the uh, the drag and drop uh, what we had there was uh, you know com combining these three events together well I had to in this one little f uh, function uh, have a dispose that got rid of all of them in this particular case uh, if I start to compose multiples uh, of these things together and timers and everything else when I call dispose it automatically cleans up all of them all the way up the tree so let me ask you a question. What's the difference between an array and an event? You know, and the answer is both of them are collections. Uh, the way I, I like to, to say it is, is uh, you know, our founder Eric Meyer created this, this term um, and it created a great paper called Your Mouse is a Database. And I, and I totally believe this is true because your, your mouse is in fact some, a database. It can be queried. It has an infinite number of mouse moves, mouse clicks, uh, mouse scrolls, uh, and, and so forth. So it should be able to be queried just as you would query uh, an array or a set or a map or anything like that. That, that was our ultimate goal and it kind of was, was fitting because we got moved eventually into the SQL Server organization of all places. So it was all about data and it's all about collections. And yes, here is category theory, sorry. Um, but we did, uh, but basically what we did is we, we took and we flipped the arrows, as it were, uh, in terms of the push versus pull. So we're like, okay, so if you do one, you get the other, uh, other for free. You kind of get that, that uh, duality, as it were. Uh, so you start off with your observable, and then you have your observer as you have before. But then you also have the enumerable as you have here. Now, the enumerable in, in, in JavaScript obviously has symbol that iterator, which uh, returns you an enumerator. And that numerator has a next method. And that next method can throw if, uh, if, if it so chooses. Uh, but then it yields that value, that enumerator value of done and the particular value. Our, our whole design was the fact that, uh, you know, with with uh, with push-based programming, there is no such thing as a try-catch. So there's a lot of things that we had to do, you know, with on air and on completed that made had to make sense uh, for that. And so the majority of your code that you're going to be writing with Rx can actually be written with just a few flexible functions, and that's it. The things that you may have already known if you're already a functional programmer. Like for example, map. Map, all it is is just uh, uh, is just the way to transform one item uh, into another and into project it into a new sequence. And what I'm using here is a is a concept called marble diagrams, and that kind of helps us uh, convey, as it were, the uh, the design of uh, uh, how each operator works over time. For example. Uh, so in, in this particular case, we're going to take each uh, individual uh, s uh, circle and, trans and turn them into diamonds. That's, uh, so 
Uh, there's a great site called RX Marbles out there. Go, go take a look at it. And it basically describes each and every operator, how they work, in great detail. And as well on our site, uh, ReactiveX. Uh, .io also has a lot of these uh, particular uh, uh, diagrams as well for pretty much every operator that we have. And so filter is another one, uh, fairly simple to do, where we all we want are the circles. Uh, so you just call the filter uh, uh, filter predic uh, with a predicate, and there you go. Uh, and concat all. So concat all is kind of a, uh, of, an, of one that I wish that uh, that uh, JavaScript kind of had. They have concat, but it's not quite the same. Uh, the idea is that we're dealing with collections of collections, and we kind of want to flatten them. So this one ends, then uh, another one comes in, this one ends, and then you're just basically flattening it down into a single collection altogether. Uh, we also have merge all, which is more of a time-based operation. So, for example, uh, when you're dealing with some that, that are kind of uh, parallel, each one of them kind of interleave, may interleave in terms of their values. Uh, and, and flat map uh, is one of, uh, one of our favorites is because it's, it's kind of the key... Uh, binding between doing a lot of, uh, of things. So it, basically you can take a, uh, a collection, you can take e each individual item and it turns it into another uh, uh, collection and then you flatten that out into a single thing. And I'll kind of show you why that's important here. So let's actually take a look at some, uh, some Netflix code here just to give you an idea uh, of how you can do things. So, for example, I want to get the top-rated films uh, from, from Netflix. How would I do that? Well, you would first start out with, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, for a given user, uh, you get their video list. And then from their video list, what you're going to do is you're going to map uh, to, get the, uh, to get the videos and then filter it out where the rating is 5, and then you kind of can cattle or just you know basically flatten it into a single sequence. So now I have all of my particular videos that I want in a nice single collection. And then I can go ahead and uh, and take a look at those uh, by calling for each or subscribe one or the other. We, you know they're one's an alias for the other. Uh, it's your choice. Uh, and then, of course, you could obviously change it to flat map instead of concat all. It doesn't really matter uh, in this particular case. Now, what if I could tell you that you could create uh, a drag event with pretty much the same amount of code that you did before? Would that, would that, would that surprise you? And so what it is, is, is imagine if we, if we had, uh, you know, DOM. Uh, so if you're using one of uh, our libraries that we ship uh, with Rx, we have a lot of abstractions, like, for example, uh, mouse down, mouse move, etc. So you can say here, for a given element, return mouse down on that element, map uh, to where the mouse move on the document, and instead of filter here, we're going to say take until. And what take until ha uh, does is it goes and it keeps on firing, 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 until another observable fires, and then it terminates, and then it cleans up the whole thing. So, and then you're basically then flattening it down to a single sequence. So once again, now you're going to have basic mouse dragging uh, capabilities right there, all by describing, uh, as it were, uh, mouse down and mouse move until mouse up. If you could do it that way, you know, fl flat map, take until you're good to go. So you, you kind of get that, that zen-like moment where you're like, holy crap, everything's a stream, so therefore I can query just about everything. And we finally got that zen moment when we realized now we have these, this notion of first-class asynchronous values. And what do I mean by first class? Well, obviously I mean that it can be uh, passed into a uh, routine, so I can pass my mouse moves, I can pass my video list, I can pass any number of, of things, but I can also return it as well. 
And, and this has obvious implications uh, for things like uh, for, for testing, for example. If I just want to swap, uh, swap out uh, mouse movements, if I want to test something out, I can just swap this out, uh, observable source out for this. And JavaScript is really f so flexible it really doesn't care, um, much to my chagrin sometimes. Uh, so let's actually talk about the, the general theory of reactivity. And when we talk about programming models, we're really talking about uh, two axes. We're talking about whether it's single value or multi-value. And then we're also going to talk about whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. So, for example, when we talk about a single value, we're talking about just an object. That could be a function, could be any number of things. And in an array, we can, uh, we can uh, in JavaScript, we can say filter and map and all of those sorts of great things that we get uh, with arrays in JavaScript. And uh, s starting to show up in, in browsers now and kind of has been kind of agreed upon are promises. And promises are great for kind of single immutable values. Uh, values that once they're, they're resolved, they're, you know, this concrete object that represents that asynchronous value. Uh, but in the upper right-hand quadrant, what we have is the observable. So the observable is the asynchronous side of that multi-value collection. But it could also work for, this, uh, for promises as well. And I'll kind of show you why that is. So uh, with promises, what you get is you get uh, is you get that first class asynchronous value. So you know you create a promise and then you can start to chain them together with then. So you'll get on fulfilled, on rejected, and why? It's it you know it's it's great to have this concrete notion of a single value. Handlers handlers are always called asynchronously, and if it's settled, it will always settle back to that particular value. So we could say player initialized, then authorized movie, else it's a login error, then play movie, or unauthorized. Pretty simple. Uh, but uh, there are many other things that come into to play when, when it comes to promises that make them really, really hard to use uh, for what we're trying to do uh, in a lot of our code. So for example, how do I cancel a promise? Well, that's not part of the spec at all. In fact, none of the stuff that ships with ES2015, uh, ES6, whatever you want to call it, comes with any notion of cancellation at all. And so you don't really know what that means. So does cancellation mean cancellation for, for me? Does it mean cancellation for everybody? Uh, does it mean uh, that, uh, that uh, cancellation throws an error? All of that is undefined behavior. Uh, they c kind of tr punted on on trying to solve that uh, for this particular go around. So it, it kind of leaves that big gaping hole of well, you're on your own uh, in order to fix that. So you're like, uh, okay, there's an existing promise. How do I cancel? I mean, there are sure there are libraries that that go around there, but it's basically putting a, a small bandage on a pretty large scab. Now, earlier when I talked about reactive programming, uh, you know, it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. You know, like for example, the dictionary defines it as readily responding to a stimulus. Okay, that's not really helpful. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, that uh, we are active and always able to receive events. Well, we've been able to do that since the dawn of time, with you know, going back to VB and so forth. Uh, and many other event-driven languages. So nothing there is particularly new. And I kind of despise the people who, th who seem to think that you know, reactive programming is this new thing. No, 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 no. It's been around for quite a long time. It's just the fact that now uh, when we're dealing with a lot of external data sources and a lot of other things, we're starting to kind of realize the value of non-blocking architectures. And like, oh, well, that's, that's, that's good to know. So uh, if, if you read the Reactive Manifesto, kind of take it with a grain of salt. It's more marketing material than it is actual uh, hard science and hard stuff. Uh, I, I view it kind of in, in you know, 
like I said, negative terms just because they, they try to, to say that reactive programming has to deal with responding to failure, responding to stimulus, responding to everything else. No, it, it just has to deal with responding to events and making sure that you're doing the right thing in a push-based architecture. So if you really want to know what it is, just read the original paper. Uh, that's where the term reactive programming really came from. So you got it? You're now reactive programmers now. Beautiful. Now, here's, here's kind of a hot button of mine. Functional reactive programming. So there's, a, there's this notion whenever someone tends to talk about Rx or anything related to Rx is they tend to talk about FRP. The problem is that FRP is a very well-known, well-defined interface for, it has a notion of continuous time. Uh, so think of it as a clock. Uh, so your objects will have a consistent uh, time. So whenever you check the value, it changes, obviously. And uh, so behaviors are just these values over time. So you have this notion of continuous time, and that behavior is your clock. Then you have events, which are very discrete objects, which, you know, for example, uh, don't have a current value, like, uh, you know, a mouse click. Well, you don't always have a mouse click. And so it was, the idea was, was to build uh, uh, flexible uh, user interfaces uh, in Haskell uh, using, a language uh, using a language and framework called FRAN, uh, or Functional uh, uh, Reactive Animations. Uh, so what it isn't is it isn't most of those libraries that just have map filter, reduce, et cetera, on, on events. It's not what the, uh, what FRP means. Uh, so I really wish that people would just start understanding what FRP really means so that we can uh, uh, really start to, to grow as a reactive programming community and stop co-opting other terms. But, you know, let's going back to the point is you already know how to do all of this uh, stuff that I'm showing you today. If you know JavaScript, then you know uh, filter, map, and for each already. The only difference is, is, well, stock data might be an observable, and so it's push-based instead of pull. That's it. So if you know uh, a lot of the functional uh, programming aspects of, of JavaScript, you are already Rx programmers. Now let's go to uh, a more difficult problem, as it were. Uh, <clears throat> How many people have written kind of a, a search or autocomplete uh, algorithm or user interface? Mm, fair number. How many people actually succeeded? <laughs> so that's that's the big the big the big question here is because I know uh, for example on my phone and I've noticed so many other websites is the fact that I'm typing along and. Uh, and it will come back with answers that I didn't ask for because it was uh, the, the the things came out of order basically. You know, with asynchronous behavior, uh, it's indeterminate which one will react first. So that's one of the biggest problems uh, with that. Not only that, but just the idea of trying to to take user behavior, which kind of tends to be rather fast, slow it down in such a way because the uh, taking time on the cloud costs money. So there are a number of factors that you want to deal with uh, when, uh, uh, when talking about uh, things like search. So for example, imagine if we had our key up behavior and we can uh, map to get its input value. Okay. Now, what I said before was uh, I want to make sure that I really only send over data when I absolutely have to. Now, doing this without uh, uh, without using Rx, you can certainly do that, and I've got plenty of code samples to do that. Uh, but it gets very difficult because then you start wrapping this to bounce function, and then you have to uh, inside of there then det uh, detect whether or not your value has changed or not given that to bounce time. But once again, it's not composable with anything else. It's just the, this more scatterbrained logic that's all throughout uh, uh, your program. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and then what you can do is you can then search uh, for uh, the latest response. And then what we can return is a sequ uh, single sequence of uh, or observable uh, for that particular term. 
and we can bind it directly to the UI. It's pretty simple. Uh, what we did was we did autocomplete in literally how many lines here? Not that many. So what exactly is Rx? So we have already talked about uh, uh, the observer and the observable, but it's it's a language neutral concept with with uh, with three main uh, pillars. It's the observer and the observable, which we've already seen, <laughs> and we've got some uh, some special you know. Special rules to it, as it were, because you know when I talked about on air, on uh, on next, and on completed, they actually mean something. Where on next, you can get zero to infinite times optionally by an on air or on completed. So, for example, if you go and you have a series of infinite values, that's just fine. If you have a couple of values and you end in an error, that's perfectly all right. That's that's. Uh, how we roll uh, if you've got two values and that. But what can't happen is you can't have overlapping values and you certainly will not ever yield something after it's done. Now, not many uh, event-based frameworks will allow you to do that. So the idea of we're trying to, to create this very strict grammar about how we talk about events is very, very important, uh, especially when you're trying to deal with trying to, to implement a kind of a try-catch finally um, kind of behavior in JavaScript directly uh, for asynchronous programs. So uh, the other aspect of of uh, Rx is the is the query options that we uh, query operators that we've already covered. You know the maps, the filters, and and so forth. You know, for, so for example, the uh, the querying the mouse uh, the mouse events. So if we really want to, like for example, if we're dragging a an image around, uh, then we're going to say mouse down flat map. Uh, t start with the uh, the offs. Uh, start with the the beginning part. Uh, call mouse move and map and calculate the deltas as they come along because there will be. And then finally you say take until mouse up. Done. Okay. All right. There is there is mouse drag. Uh, so you could uh, literally bind that to a, to a UI, move it around on the screen. So yes, as, as it were, I did in fact cross the streams, but nothing bad happened. Really. <clears throat> So let's talk about another uh, particular interesting problem that uh, the people have had problems with. So uh, luckily we have uh, Jafar here uh, in the audience who, uh, who has provided such uh, great inspiration. Uh, so for example, uh, what if you're dealing with a particular user interface where, uh, where you, you're on a pretty hardware constrained device, but you want to make sure that it's it's very usable so it loads only what's in, uh, on the screen and then anything that isn't is removed automatically. And you want, of course, a little bit of fudge factor. So for example, if I'm scrolling up, scrolling down and I haven't quite made up my mind, I don't want to just suddenly just start doing all of these operations at once. So you want to keep, remember, keep memory footprint low, but also be respons uh, responsible, responsive and respectful of the, of the user. And so to do that, what we can do is we can start to take the scroll and we can th uh, debounce it or throttle it just a little bit. And then what we can do is we can say whether the row is visible or not. And if it is, uh, and if it is distinct, meaning if it's either true or false, then then great, we've got a row visibility. So we've now got when it's visible and invisible. So now we can start to to basically interval over there, watch your screen as it's going along, and if things start to move out of uh, sight, whether they're uh, when they become invisible, as it were, it cleans them up. So that take until cleans all of those particular uh, rows up automatically, all the resources there, gone. That's why the things like Rx are very, very compelling is the fact that uh, it's, it's easy to say that, no, I've never had to unsubscribe from an event ever. Uh, or I haven't had to worry about cancellation on an, uh, on an Ajax request because, well, I called dispose and it happens automatically for me. All of those things uh, are very, very relevant when, when Rx is involved because unlike promises, you get that cancellation behavior, you get the deterministic behavior, and so forth. 
you know, you can still deal with callback hell as we had before, but you could also uh, rewrite it using Rx, for example, where you can initialize the uh, initialize the player. You can take the play attempts, and uh, then you can uh, try and authorize the person three times, and uh, take until that person cancels. Like oh, I'm trying to authorize, you know, you get the spinning beach ball or whatever you get, and you're like, oh gosh, cancel, cancel, cancel. Well, you want to a way to do that and RX provides you that way through you know take until for example and then what you can do is you can take that authorization as it were and then say alright we're good we have a ticket we can play and the world is good else you know if there's an error well then handle it then so the third aspect uh, of RX and really what makes it m one of the more fascinating things that I've ever seen is this this notion of schedulers it's the kind of the how what and where of things actually happen so it's kind of the the key questions you want to ask are well where am I going to run a timer for example how am I going to run it where am I going to produce the events and how do I need to synchronize with the UI so one of those is is very much uh, on point. So, for example, if you're doing animations, for example, if you're doing animations, you're going to probably want to use request animation frame. Well, to do that inside of RX, you can do that by just putting in uh, the request animation frame scheduler, and suddenly every operation that you're going to do is going to be done on via a request animation frame callback. You could do it set timeout, where it's only going to use set timeout as its, as its scheduling mechanism. Uh, when it needs to synchronize with the UI, for example, in Angular, of all places, there there's kind of this digest uh, capability where you can kind of tell uh, within a particular scope that, hey, you can update the UI. Well, to do that, you can use, once again, a scheduler to, to basically say, take this one particular action and apply it during a given scope. And we're going even further in the, in the future where we can start to say web workers and so forth uh, can be done over schedulers. Uh, that's that works kind of started, uh, but the idea is taking the the entire expression tree, sending it over to a different machine, calculating the result, and sending it back. Uh, we have the beginnings of the parser there, uh, hopefully before too long. So really, schedulers are the answer. They introduce the concurrency model. Operations, any operation can be parameterized. I can I can go from immediate to timeout to request animation frame to whatever I want to at any point in the uh, in the calculation, and this also kind of provides us uh, t testing benefits as well because now instead of having to be being tied to a concrete thing such as set timeout, I can swap it out for a complete virtual time to say well. Uh, I'm going to run things through historically, or I'm going to start testing. So you kind of get this this many implementations of this schedule, and you also get the once again the uh, the, the cancellation uh, beauty that you had before. Uh, so that cancellation goes all the way down into the deep core of RX. So when I cancel something, it goes all the way into the scheduler and cancels it. And it also makes testing co your code very very easy. So for example. All of our code in Rx is written exactly kind of this way, which is we can take and uh, create a test scheduler. We can kind of create a sequence at 300, 400, and 500. They yield values. 300 it yields applicative. At 400 it uh, yields 2015, and finally on 500 it uh, it uh, calls on completed. So uh, basically, it's just a, a thing that yields two values and says it's done. So what we can do is we can pluck the length from there, and then we can as absolutely assert that on next at, at 300 ticks, uh, we have uh, a length of 11, and at 400 ticks, we have a length of 4 every single time. Uh, we don't have to do any async testing. We don't have to do any you know, waiting for, for timers, nothing. Because of the fact that we can rip out basically your concurrency model, it becomes that much more testable. Now, reactive streams is another uh, interesting aspect uh, that people are starting to get into, which is uh, it's trying to solve uh, reactive programming for 
uh, for for the JVM in particular, but but it has some very interesting questions. Is uh, for example, is how do I deal with with things like back pressure? Because when you're dealing with say RX on uh, RxJS on the server, which it works quite well, uh, how do I deal with the fact that, for example, I'm capturing all of this user input, whether it's stocks, uh, stock ticker updates, uh, GPS feeds, what have whatever, but my end source, say uh, uh, you know. Uh, my uh, my database just can't keep up for for whatever reason. Uh, we have kind of some of those answers already, uh, whether they're lossy or lossless. So you know if it's lossy, you, I could say it's uh, uh, pos uh, you know possible. I could pause and resume. I can sample it. I can throttle to bounce. Uh, any number of those kinds of things where I just you know don't care if things are dropped on the floor. And in fact, you can also, you know, be lossless as well as to say that uh, I'm going to say buffer, uh, you know, buffer with uh, with a time of say five seconds. So give me everything that happens within five seconds. Uh, great. Uh, anything that happens, you know, limited to a hundred events at a time. Great. I can do that too. Uh, and then possible buffered is the idea is that you can pause and resume, and then when that you call resume. All of those buffer uh, that buffer gets emptied, and you're good to go again. And the idea behind controlled is the fact that you can start requesting n number of items directly from the uh, uh, from the observable sequence. Uh, so that kind of brings up uh, another thing, which is async await. Uh, so async await is is a thing that's coming to JavaScript, we hope, at some point. Uh, but it adds async and await for uh, for for promises, and it's already been accepted into stage one at least for uh, for uh, for ECMAScript seven or whatever we want to call it now. Jafar can probably. Uh, 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 comment on that, but the idea here is that we can start to go through and await each individual animation as they happen. But guess what? We can already do that with Rx. Uh, we have this idea of uh, Rx.spawn. So uh, in ES2015, we have this notion of, of generators. Really cool stuff. Highly recommend that you uh, that you read up on it. And so any time that you have a uh, a runtime with generators, we can already say like get uh, applicative yield get applicative uh, try it three times and uh, and if if there's a failure uh, just return me a cached version we're good to go so that's available today in any uh, in environment uh, such as Chrome for example and IOJS that support generators uh, today so you can get that kind of Asynky, awaity kind of feel to it, uh, so it, it makes your program just seem a little bit more linear than it is. And yes, and there's a good reason we had him here as well, is because uh, uh, async generators is another interesting aspect of where things can go uh, with uh, uh, with observables. So could you could imagine, as it were, that observables are built right into your runtime. Uh, so any mouse downs, mouse moves, and mouse up are just built right into your particular runtime. How cool would that be? Is the fact that I don't have to worry about wrapping all of these sorts of things, but then I can just kind of build on top of it, which would be really, really cool. So, you know, in order to really kind of learn Rx, there you know there have been many uh, many great uh, tutorials out there. Andre out there has uh, a great uh, post of uh, basically uh, you know the the introduction to RX that you've been missing. Uh, just because sometimes our documentation can be rather dense and MSDN like, uh, we want people to be able be able to basically understand at the at that you know deep core level that all you're learning is just regular functional programming over over data structures and no more. So this learn rx uh, that Jafar has worked on is a way that you can start with arrays and start to do with map, filter, concat all, reduce and zip. And then what you can do is then you realize, well, I'm going to turn it on its head and start using observables uh, in just the same context and you're good to go. So uh, that's it's been a very very helpful uh, uh, learning tool. I've used it quite often. Netflix uses it. I've it's it's been a wonder. 
Uh, just as well, like I mentioned earlier, RX Marbles uh, is the uh, is the site where uh, basically if I wanted to see how it, an individual operator actually works, I can look uh, and see, well, if we have merge, what, what does that look like? And here what we have is we have these values here uh, that uh, – that as they're coming along, uh, you'll have another stream that also comes along. And how does it, how does the merging actually happen? Well, this kind of shows you exactly how it works. Now, if you want to find a particular uh, site where you can see that RxJS is really in action, I mean, you can't really look, at, say, your Netflix player and just take a look at the at at the code. Uh, but you can for for SweetJS. So SweetJS is a uh, kind of a macro. Uh, tool for for JavaScript, and if the e the editor itself uh, is written uh, uh, in Rx, and so any of the key bindings, any of the window resizes, all of those things are observables, and so I highly recommend you to take a look at the uh, uh, go to that site, and then go and take a look at the source code, because the source code has so much so many re you know really cool things about it. So, for example, on document ready, we can uh, initialize the key maps by turning that into a stream. We can initialize the output and the output options by turning that into a stream. So it's all about all of these particular things uh, and, and setting up the code mirror so that both sides start to do it. So you got zip, uh, uh, you know, zip, so you got one side and the other side, and they're both synchronized. And you're just using the functional programming concepts that you already know and use today. So what about the libraries that I'm already using? Now, that's always been a, you know, a question. Does Rx replace everything that I've ever done? And the answer is no. Uh, Rx, in fact, uh, what we try to always say is it's kind of your, your glue or, or your duct tape, as it were, depending on how handy you uh, are. Um, to to really build your applica uh, rich applications. I mean, you yes, you can build uh, your entire application out of Rx itself, uh, but you could also mix it in with React, with Dojo, with Backbone, jQuery, uh, Angular, Ember, and so forth. And with Backbone, uh, jQuery, Ember, uh, Zepto, and so forth, you get some kind of that behavior for free because when you call from event, we automatically look and see if the element that you passed in happened to be from jQuery, Angular, etc., and use those native bindings versus going directly to the DOM. Uh, but we also have uh, community-driven uh, libraries such as Rx jQuery, Rx Angular, Rx Ember, uh, Rx Dojo, R, uh, and so forth. Uh, that's uh, and even, uh, as I'll show you in just a second, even a lot of Rx React uh, particular things that uh, are really, really cool. So Rx in a virtual DOM world actually makes a lot of sense here because when people start to think about uh, start to think about uh, React and they're thinking about unidirectional data flow, you know, you really can't say. Uh, React without saying flux at the same time, just because you're you're talking about this sort of uh, this this term this kind of backend architecture of how you get st uh, you know how you get your data, how you uh, persist data, and so forth, and that's an absolute perfect uh, thing for uh, for things to do. So check out some of these projects minus async React. Um, hint hint. Um, but once again, it's also very interesting. There's another project uh, called uh, 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 Cycle, and so Cycle is the idea is the uh, I, uh, from Andre here out in the, the crowd, and the idea here is it's called it's it's reactive MVC, but it's with the model view intent architecture. So it, basically, the intent is is a component whose idea is to to translate those user events into say model friendly events. So it you know translates those view like idioms into model I idioms. So it's kind of that that translation layer, as it were, and just to make sure that it actually does what it does. Uh, so the model basically exposes, for example, the name changes in this particular example, and then uh, in uh, in our view we're going to listen for those name changes, and then basically from there we're going to start to uh, to uh, render a div and label and input field and say hello someone. So that 
to me holds a lot of promise uh, for a fully deep down reactive MVC kind of, uh, of thing. So uh, I've got a few demos to, to run through if I can so do so. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Hello, come on. Okay, and let's see if I can throw it over there. All right, beautiful. All right. So uh, here, uh, here first of all is the uh, the RX site. Uh, you know, lots and lots of really cool stuff here. We have pretty much all you need to know to get started here, uh, including demos, uh, documentation, and so forth. Um, from there, you can go on to uh, let's see. There is the Sweet JS editor. Really, really cool site. You can take a look and see what kind of uh, uh, how uh, the code uh, and uh, kind of interact with it. Here's the actual code, uh, and you can take a look and see how it was done. But all of this was pretty much uh, reactive observables. It's really, really cool stuff. Uh, here we have. Uh, I can't even read that. Uh, oh yeah, cycle. Yeah, cycle from. Uh, uh, from Andre, uh, so he has a to-do MVC, so uh, finished presentation, I think I can click that as saying I think I've finished that. Um, uh, just as well, uh, you know, there's a great blog post that he did about that in the virtual DOM. Uh, now here's a, a fun one uh, that uh, uh, Angus, uh, what, is, what is his last name? I can't remember off the top of my head, but he was trying to come up with a way of you know showing off physics and RX working together. So it's kind of a uh, it's kind of a neat thing to to, uh, to look at. So it can do con collision detection and so forth uh, with SVG and so forth. So it, it's it, so it's not only just for for data binding, but it's also you know quite honestly for games. So you've got your to do list. Uh, you know your autocomplete, so I can start typing, uh, start typing in uh, things, just like uh, making that example that I showed you very real. Um, but as well as you can do, you know, just hardcore games. Uh, you know, hardcore meaning uh, you know games for first graders or something like that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, as you can see, you know, a game has a number of concepts to it. Uh, so for example, the game loop, uh, you're talking about uh, collision detection. You're talking about uh, responding to events. Um, all of those things kind of play into uh, to what RX is really all about, is, is managing a lot of those things that just become unbearable over time. Um, this one likes to crash every so often, but uh, uh, the, uh, the idea here is we can start listening, for example, to uh, on D3 to see how people, uh, what people are doing on uh, um, on Wikipedia at any given time. It uh, looks like we're starting to get some data in here. Uh, but yeah, it shows you uh, just quickly how, how quickly we're sampling data when a new user shows up, uh, all of the activity, and just basically using Rx as kind of that real-time uh, aspect that I said that was very, very important to what why Rx is, is, uh, is important. Uh, we can also do things like, you know, two-way data binding and all of that using uh, what we call TKO, uh, which is part of uh, a part of our examples that we we ship uh, with RX. Uh, we literally have about 20 samples. We're always looking for more, uh, so that's great. You know, you can also do you know simple little things like animations. You know, it's Time flies like an arrow, just basically adding a little bit of a delay to each individual thing as they come along. Super simple, super stupid, but yes, a lot of fun. And you know, like I said, games are a lot of fun uh, when you can uh, when you can start to move uh, move them around, and then you can also do jumps, change directions, deal with gravity, deal with a. Uh, 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 frames per second, so we're dealing with 60 frames per second while we're playing this game here. Uh, all of these things make RX a very, very compelling thing, is because all of those particular things around movement, frames per second, the game loop, etc., is all RX. So, uh, with that, I'll open it up to any questions. 
stunned silence. I love it. All right. I love it. So, well, I guess with that, then, I can go and uh, from current slide. All right. So we did that. So on completed. So thank you very much. And I've got a little video to play here for uh, uh, for people that are, are ready. Uh, so if you can remember one particular term uh, from this presentation, I want it to be one thing. Oh God. Push. That was rad. I think I can do it too. Push! So thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, next talk going to start in about five minutes. Going to be uh, Bill Fisher talking about uh, the flux architecture.